All right, I think we'll get started. So uh, again, I want to thank you for joining me for today's webinar and it's on using our BioFlex personal therapy photobiomodulation home devices for helping with your gut biome, microbiome or your gut health. And this is really a fascinating topic. In fact, there's a whole new field uh, um, with respect to using light therapy and your gut microbiome. So that's why I wanted to do a webinar on it because I thought it was really interesting, especially the last five to 10 years has seen a huge amount of research specifically in the microbiome and how it communicates with the rest of your body and how important it is with respect to health and lots of um, problems that people get, um, like neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, believe it or not, links to autism. Now, a lot of this is still, you know, they're trying to figure everything out, but it, it certainly seems that if you have a healthy gut, you will be healthier. And if you have uh, um, dysbiomia or, or um, not a healthy gut, then um, then unfortunately your body responds negatively and can and can get chronic illnesses and diseases. So that's what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about that and hopefully you find it um, uh, helpful. So if you're not aware, I'm the medical director at BioFlex Laser Therapy. I've been here for over a decade, 12 years, something like that. Uh, I am a chiropractor. My background before that was in molecular biology, molecular genetics at University of Toronto, where I also did graduate work. And uh, I'm pretty scientific and research-based. And I recognize that a lot of people still have a hard time accepting light therapy um, as, as something other than pseudoscience, which is really, at this point, um, I find... I find it difficult to believe that people don't understand that light has an effect on the body. I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point. We've known it for a long time, but there's still people out there that I've been trying to join some Reddit subgroups and they keep booting me off because they're saying it's a pseudoscience. And to be honest, uh, I'm not quite sure the moderator even knows how to spell science. But anywho, let's uh, let's move on. So we're going to talk a little bit about BioFlex personal therapy systems in general, what photobiomodulation therapy is, and then we'll get into the gut microbiome. Uh, it's really fascinating. I'm not pretending to be an expert in it, but I've done a lot of reading on it. So I should, I'd like to share some of the main topics and points with you. If you have any questions along the way, specifically about this webinar, um, type them into the Q&A box. That's what I'll be looking at the, at the end of today's webinar. Okay, so really, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about using these systems for gut microbiome at the end of the webinar. So really this is geared towards people that have this system or perhaps you're thinking about getting it or how to use it for this particular um, issue. And we have two different types of personal system 120 or 180 it has to do with the number of diodes or light diodes and the power and the size of the, of the, um, of the light array. You can see the two different sizes here. Uh, they have bicolor superluminous diodes. There's a specialized LED. They're not lasers. Um, packing in 120 lasers in a small area like that would fry it. It uh, requires too much energy. However, LEDs emit light and of the correct wavelength. Uh, and so it's very effective for photobiomodulation, believe it or not. And that's why the term is no longer called low-level laser therapy. Um, it's referred to as photo, as in photon of light biomodulation. So the source of the photon can be from multiple types of diodes. The biggest advantage we have in our equipment is each one of these diodes can emit red and near infrared out of one diode. Everyone else, and I mean that, every other manufacturer will have a red diode and then a near infrared diode and then a red diode, and then a near-infrared diode. So the spacing and the energy density is much lower. It's just the way it is. We pack ours very close together, and you, by emitting light from each and every diode, the same wavelength, we can actually 
um, get a fair amount of energy in that specific wavelength in that um, in that tissue. And that's where the advantage is amongst other things. So essentially how this works is that, whoops, let me back up there. Um, when the diodes emit red light, um, if initially that's what first comes out of the equipment, then it will penetrate to relatively superficial depth because red light's absorbed by a lot of different photoacceptors, including melanin and hemoglobin. So it doesn't go really deep. And as you'll find out, it's not great for the, treating the microbiome or the gut. Uh, near infrared can go much deeper. The longer it's on, the more photons that can kind of go to its greatest maximum depth, uh, which can be, hmm, it, it varies, right? I mean, uh, depending on, on what structures are uh, in the way, but it can go several centimeters, maybe even five, six, seven centimeters, not to mention it can have a blood-borne or systemic effect, which is part of the way it's going to alter or affect the microbiome. The controller looks something like this. It, it refers to anatomical areas. Notice there's not one for the gut microbiome. This is something I'm doing that you'll have to kind of um, MacGyver one of the protocols, and I'll talk to you how to do that um, for best effects for, for doing that. There's treatment stages, which basically reflects the intensity and the pulsations of light from uh, one bar all the way up to four bars. And then of course, power button, stop, pause, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward controller. Photobomb modulation therapy is still being researched heavily and still trying to understand exactly what it does. But we do know that it does have an effect on many aspects of the cellular machinery, including mitochondria. As everyone I'm sure is aware, it seems to have an effect on um, reactive oxygen species, which is a free radical. And, and when it sort of spikes up a little bit, it does some positive things to the cell. When it's too high, it does negative things to the cell. And it can have an effect on um, ion channels, like the calcium ion channel. And um, one of the byproducts of producing ATP or more ATP is nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. And that's another temporary effect of, of photobomb modulation. So there's lots of things at play. Still trying to learn more, but we do know from really quite good research what, what's going on with, with light of these wavelengths and how it interacts with the cell. There's really two ways it's going to work. One is directly when the affected cell or tissues that are injured or diseased or what have you absorbs the light. That's a direct effect. But because of the depth of certain tissues, sometimes you can't get light directly to that tissue. But you can have what's called an indirect effect or systemic effect, or there's different names for it. Typically, we refer to it as a systemic effect. And this is where the light interacts with stem cells, other immune cells of the white of the of the blood, uh, like white blood cells. Uh, even uh, it can penetrate into bone marrow, depending on where it is, like the sternum, um, and it can have an effect on bone marrow stem cells as well. And I've talked about this in the past. And, and these effects are, are mediated by the blood and can travel deeper, right? Because circulation goes everywhere. And so you might have some positive effects that way as well. In fact, that's probably one of the hypotheses how this might help the, your gut microbiome. Most of today's lecture is, um, is based on a specific piece of research. And in it, they, they, I'm quoting them as saying, it's been recognized in recent years that the gut microbiome is inextricably linked with health and disease. Uh, the specific um, references in uh, this paper you can see below here um, in 2019. And here it is here. And they've introduced a new, new term called photobiomics, essentially how light or photons of light can affect the biome. And not just the gut biome, there's other biomes. There's an oral, right? A skin, um, uh, other mucosa in your body. So it's not just the gut, but that's what I'm re referring to today. This particular paper in part was written by Michael Hamlin and uh, Daniel Johnstone, Johnstone, who, by the way, was a guest lecturer at one of our master classes two years ago. So if you want to hear him speak, um, you can find that master class on our website. 
It was in uh, 2021, I believe. He's from Australia, and he's uh, an expert in systemic effects of photobiomodulation. So I'm sure everyone's aware that human microbiome is billions and billions of bacteria, but not just bacteria, there's other types of um, um, uh, uh, viruses and proteases and all sorts of wacky, weird um, single-celled creatures, and they are typically symbiotic living within our bodies. As I mentioned, it's not just in your gut, it's in your skin, your mouth, your nose, your eyes, your ears, you know, anywhere where it's a little bit moist and warm in there, uh, you might find a microbiome. And so there's been a lot of interest in this microbiome and how it interacts with the cells and then the tissues of our body. They've counted, Lisa's paper mentions, um, well over a thousand bacteria, uh, which represents over a thousand species they figure upwards of 6,000 strains of bacteria. And it contributes 150 times the genetic material of our own genome. So there's lots of DNA at play. And as I mentioned, this can communicate or these bacteria and, and other um, single cell creatures can, can communicate with our body. As you would expect, if you're lean and healthy, you tend to have a healthier microbiome than if you're the opposite, right? And this has been established in humans and animals. So it's now pretty much recognized that if you have a healthy gut microbiome to a large an extent, it's going to help you be healthy. And when you have changes in your health status, then this can also affect the uh, gut microbiome. So I'll talk a little bit about this as we go along. And now they have sort of mapped out microbiome sort of communication channels with between, say, your brain and your heart, uh, your muscles and your lungs and your skin, uh, even links to gut microbiome and arthritis and pain. So you know, as much as we just want to take an Advil or an Aleve or something to help with pain, um, unfortunately, you're just masking the problem, right? And and the problem needs to be dealt with or at least looked at. Um, and that's where, you know, you want to do lots of different things, including perhaps trying to take care of your, your gut microbiome if you're not already. Let's face it, if you're living in, in Western culture, um, Typically, this isn't well done because we don't eat the foods that um, are prebiotic or probiotic very much, and this leads to poor gut health. But I'll, I'll I'll get to that. So the composition of your microbiome it's affected obviously from the time you were born, the type of birth, obviously um, through infancy, how you were fed, to adulthood, what you're eating you know, your age and stress and, oh my God, you, you name it, it's going to affect your your gut health, uh, including things like alcohol consumption. I know, geez, it seems like we can't even have a glass of wine anymore, but um, <laughs> I think I think everything in moderation is okay. Uh, and of course, consumption of, and I'll talk about this, prebiotics and probiotics. These all shape the composition of your microbiome and it can be altered and changed over time. So if you change your diet, this can affect it, either short-term or long-term. And it's generally, um, there's a consensus here that if you have a, a wide diversity of plant products in your diet, then you're gonna have a greater species richness in your gut. Um, whereas if you're more you know, meat-based, um, kind of scenario, then this leads to replacement of what's referred to as carbohydrate fermenting bacteria with bile tolerant bacteria and has uh, implications on your uh, um, gut health. And you can imagine they're not good implications. The gut microbiota or, or biome assists in food digestion. It assists in how that food is converted to energy. It can contribute to vitamin mineral production and intake. Um, and the more efficient energy production, 
from a dysregulated microbiome might be one factor in causes of obesity, for example. Okay. Um, so there's lots of things at play here that, you know, if you're trying to say lose weight that you need to look at. And of course, we all know the link to antibiotics or even other non-antibiotic drugs like proton, proton pump inhibitors. They can possibly disrupt your microbiome and generate potential for long-term effects. So um, one has to be very um, careful when you do take these medications that you're trying to assist your microbiome in, in surviving the effects of these drugs. Now, the main communication pathways between the microbiome and the body are more than likely through the immune system, something called redox signaling, which I really won't get into, it's kind of complex, the endocrine system, and um, one of the major nerves, um, uh, autonomic nerves called the vagus nerve, which is uh, this crazy nerve that spreads out through your whole, your whole gut. And um, this pathway as well, that of course is connected to your central nervous system. So it has an in, uh, a direct effect on your, on your nervous system as well. One of the major known effects of microbiome is a release of something of a type of uh, acid called short chain fatty acids or SCFAs. They have different names, butyrate, acetate, propanate. And these are produced by fermentation of undigested polysaccharides or proteins. These SCFAs influence the integrity of the gut mucosa by increasing the epithelial, which is the out, outer lining of the gut, uh, its integrity and production of mucose, and it influences the body's energy balance, inflammatory response, and protects against cancer. So in other words, you want the microbiome to be producing a higher level of the short chain fatty acids. That's good. Now, this picture just sort of gives you a representation of what's going on here. You can see here, the, this, this purple line here, you can see these are cells. That's, that represents your villi and your, you know, the external portion or epithelial portion of your gut, right? So... From the, uh, from the stomach and uh, small intestine, and large intestine aligned uh, with these cells. And then of course, just on the outside of that is your gut microbiome. And you can see here, they can release SF, uh, SFAs, SCFAs. Ugh. Um, they also can release uh, neurotransmitters and other immune modulatory metabolites that have an effect and communicate via the vagus nerve, um, through um, gut peptides and other uh, modes of metabolism and can have a, an effect on your brain function, neural communication, and even your behavior. So, so we know there's all these, these links through the gut biome. Now, what I wanna sort of the takeaway for this, this diagram here, which is quite complex, is on the far left, you'll see that um, when you have a healthy um, microbiome, there's an enrichment of these, these beneficial bacteria. There's different types of them, but the ones you've probably heard of are lactobacillus, uh, bifidobacteria, uh, acromancia. Um, these are the ones that you usually see in, in probiotic um, foods or you know yogurts and those kinds of things, like the good yogurts. Um, and so these help with improved lipid metabolism, insulin sensitivity. So looking at this as improve, if you improve your gut microbiome, it can help with diabetes. Um, and it also can reduce inflammation because it helps monitor or helps establish more anti-inflammatory uh, state in your, in your gut, which of course reduces the risk of, of cancer as well. And a healthy gut can delay the onset of certain types of non-communicable diseases like um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, cardiovascular disease. When you, when you think about it, um, it, 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 that's a really important factor. Um, diabetes, obesity, uh, many di different types of cancer. And then I mentioned earlier about some of the neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, even multiple sclerosis, they're finding links to your gut microbiome. Now on the far right is when you have microbial 
dysbiosis or dysfunctional um, microbiome, um, where you have having increasing glucose levels, increasing insulin res resistance, and, and a shift towards pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, and this will all have negative effects. And so you'll start to increase other species of bacteria that um, that uh, are have a negative effect on your body. You can see the ones listed here, the like enterococcus and uh, lacnospirasis. My Latin's uh, been a while there, spiracei and bactericides. Um, there's others as well too. So we've all heard the term probiotic. This was adopted not that long ago in 2001 um, at an international meeting of experts in the field uh, via the uh, World Health Organization. And its definition is microorganisms that are beneficial to the health of the host when used in appropriate dosages with the capacity of survival in the gut without the danger of transferring elements of pathogenic, uh, pathogenicity, I can't say that word for some reason, antibiotic resistance and toxicity. These probiotics can modulate the immune system, have uh, anti-inflammatory activity, as well as regulate the innate and adaptive immune system. Whoopsie. Um, and we're probably all familiar with these foods that are high in probiotics. Usually they're fermented foods, right? Uh, fermented sauerkraut, fermented uh, pickles. In the, in done, the pickles, by the way, and olives, they, they're, they're like, have to be the old, a certain way of, of making them that the, the ones that you buy in the regular grocery store tend not to be fermented that is my understanding uh, but things like kimchi uh you know korean kimchi cabbage um that's really good sauerkraut there's lots of other fermented foods i'm sure you're aware of that have lactobacillus acidophilus and uh, other species that you've heard of even frozen yogurts uh, kefir a yogurt drink lassi another yogurt drink in, from india acidophilus milk buttermilk aged cheeses um, as I mentioned, fermented cabbage, uh, pickles, and olives, and it's certain if they're fermented, um, are very good sources of probiotics. Prebiotics, um, this is a little bit different. These are a group of nutrients, so basically foods, and not bacteria, and they're degraded by the gut microbiome. Um, so these dietary prebiotics are selectively fermented in your body, and this can help with the gastrointestinal microbiota uh, conferring benef benefits upon your health. Just some examples are things like asparagus, sugar beets, garlic, chicory, onion, artichoke, wheat, honey, banana, barley, tomato, rye, soybean, um, even cow's milk, um, human milk, obviously, um, peas, beans, uh, seaweed, microalgae. And, you know, you can make a case for saying things like, well, you know, human or, or uh, um, cow's milk isn't healthy, you know, this and that or whatever. And you have to look at both sides, right? You have to look to see how you're, um, what you're trying to get out of it. And fermented milk, especially when we talk about some of these um, drinks, whatever, um, they can they can help um, depending on, on how much is consumed and so forth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a new field called photobiomics and it's relatively new. And essentially the, the mechanisms of how photobiomodulation modulation works with the microbiome is still being um, studied and researched, but we have some ideas. So essentially the positive effects of, of light might be through direct absorption to the microbiome, especially in animal model studies, but in humans, that's maybe a little bit more challenging depending on this, our, the size of our gut, but it may, may also be due to systemic effect which can result in decreased inflammation and have an effect on the, your immune system. Now, photobiomodulation um, can alter the microbial diversity of the microbiome in many animal studies. And uh, this one in particular, and I'm gonna show it to you, um, when mice were treated three times a week with near infrared, um, they found um, they found improvement of the microbiome, but not with the red. And in this particular study, they found a 10,000 fold increase in the proportion of th this particular bacterium, Allobaculum, which is a very good one, um, after 14 days of treatment with near infrared. Again, 
they did both, but they found the near infrared had these effects and the red did not. And by the way, this is all from that paper I showed you earlier by Hamlin and Johnstone, okay? Um, and there's another reference here to some experiments on Parkinson's disease. You can see the authors here along with their colleagues, and they showed some neuroprotective effects against a mouse model Parkinson's, again, in mice. Um, it, it was achieved and delivered to areas of the body remote from the brain. In other words, they treated the gut and had a protective effect on the brain. Now, this was in mice. Okay, so don't run out and tell everyone, your family doctor, that some, some pseudo <laughs> guy on, on Bioflex was telling you this. Um, it's just interesting and it may have, there may be benefits here, um, but there is some human stuff. So I'm going to get to that as well too. Now there's a systemic potential systemic effect. Remember, if you have questions, type them into the Q and A box, not to the chat box. I, I'll, I'll, I try to do the, the Q and A box, but that's my preference because I don't have to go back and forth. Um, the systemic effects of photobomb modulation is postulated to be due to again, effect on immune cells, stem cells, or some kind of unidentified mediator that circulates the benefits of photobiomodulation. Um, and it's this mediator, and they're still trying to sort out, could be platelets, not really sure, uh, that might be linked to the changes in the microbiome. This is a repeat, I don't know why I did that. Um, so photobiomodulation modulation may serve as a way to beneficially change the microbiome for a number of different inflammatory neurological diseases, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, along with altering your diet and probiotics, they've also used a technique called fecal transplants. They've had a lot of success with these. I forget the specific bacteria, but it's been helpful for IBS and ulcerative colitis. Sounds kind of weird, but it's just reintroducing healthy fecal bacteria back into your gut. Um, and, it's, and it's showing a lot of good promise there. Although, of course, it wouldn't be covered by any health plan or whatever, because they um, this is, you know, it's kind of the early stages. So we're looking at photobomb modulation as being an adjunct treatment along with these um, other techniques to alter your microbiome. This particular research is a case report, so it's a human, uh, but it's a case report, so it's not like a clinical trial. And uh, they they looked at altering the microbiome. This particular patient had cancer, um, and so what they did was they tested their microbiome uh, on nine occasions, three times before any treatment, three times after radiotherapy, and the commencement of immunotherapy for breast cancer, and then three times after photobomb modulation treatment. They use near infrared, it's a 904 wavelength. They pulse it out at 700. I don't think that really pulsing really means much at this point. But I did want to reference this 861 joules of energy. And I'll talk about that with reference to using your equipment. They did this over the abdomen three times a week for 11 weeks. And what they found was that the microbiome of the participant showed significant changes in diversity after photobiomodulation treatment, um, but not after the cancer therapy, with an increase in number of known beneficial bacteria and a decrease in the number of potentially pathogenic bacterium. So they basically conclude that the results suggest the possibility of photobiomodulation photobiom might alter the microbiome and might be a therapeutic avenue for chronic diseases with maybe, you know, otherwise limited treatment options. Because it's safe, it kind of makes sense to give it a try. That's that's kind of how I would operate. Um, this is another paper uh, in, uh, in part written by Daniel Johnstone, who I've mentioned earlier. And this is a photobomb modulation of the microbiome implications for metabolic and inflammatory diseases. Now this was an animal model study on, uh, this is the one I referenced earlier. And uh, it used red and near infrared on mice on their abdomen. And they either did single or multiple doses over a two week period. And what they found was that one genus in particular, this allobaculum, significantly increased after infrared, but not red by day 14. And this is a very good, healthy bacterium to have. So, 
uh, this is a quote from the paper, they, they have demonstrated for the first time that photobiomodulation can alter the microbiome diversity in healthy mice, increasing the numbers of this bacterium that's associated with a healthy gut microbiome. So this change, again, it's from the paper, um, is probably a result of the photobiomodulation therapy affecting the actual host, um, which then in turn influenced the microbiome as, as opposed to altering the microbiome. Now, bacteria can absorb light and they can be altered. Um, so it can actually have an effect on bacteria, but the, the ability of light to get into the bacteria uh, might be limited, although mice, uh, that might be possible. In humans, I think it might be a little bit more challenging. And so basically, they're saying that, hey, this is a good avenue to explore. It might be helpful as an adjunct therapy for um, obesity, other lifestyle-related disorders, and cardiovascular issues, neurodegenerative diseases, that kind of scenario. So, okay, how are you going to use your equipment? I guess that's probably the question, right? So um, you want to use near-infrared. I don't think you, at this point, you use the red. You just want to use the near infrared. And this will have a direct effect, possibly, but more than likely, perhaps a systemic effect that will have then an effect on the microbiome and the gut cells. So I'm going to suggest, oh, I didn't, uh, yeah, I'm going to suggest you, if you have the smaller P120, you can do up to four placements to cover the gut. If you have the P180, maybe two or three would cover the area of your abdomen. It depends on your stature and so forth. I'm going to say, suggest you use the HIP protocol. I'll tell you why. And to use the later stages, maybe the, the, the third or the fourth, um, which has the highest amount of energy. So if we want to, if we want to replicate that 861 joules or thereabouts that showed some positive effects, then you're going to want to use that HIP protocol for anywhere from about six-ish minutes up to 10 minutes. Um, so if you do the math, and I'll do that for you, and I did it for you, is that um, you get about 140 joules of energy for every minute. And so for 6.2 minutes, it's roughly 868 joules. Um, so, you know, if you did 10 minutes, it's a lot more, but it, you know, it all depends on how much adipose tissue you have and your size and so forth. So in that range of six to 10 minutes is probably, um, would be the closest to mimicking what that case study showed. And that really, I don't have a lot to go with here. Um, I don't ha even have a lot of anecdotes myself and we don't have any much clinical research. So this is kind of the early stages of understanding this. Will it be harmful? No. Um, will it be helpful? More than likely, it would be helpful. Oh, there's that. I don't know what happened there. But so the the infrared diodes emit 20 or 2,331 milliwatts of energy. Uh, that's 2.33 watts. When you multiply that by one minute, you get 140 joules. That's why I got that 140 joule there. Okay, you don't really need to know the math, but I'm just walking you through it just because some people love this kind of stuff. God knows why, but there you go. Okay, so I'll get to your question shortly. Uh, next webinars, I'm introducing our Zone and Zone XL uh, um, LED panels. The question might be, well, can I use these panels for gut health? I mean, maybe, but I would really prefer you use something on the stump, on the gut, on the actual skin, because you'll get light deeper into the body. So my preference is to use something that touches the skin. I'm also doing a webinar on laser therapy for long COVID and then one on, for shingles uh, into September and October. Oh, it's September the 28th. It was the 21st for long COVID, but I changed it to 28th. I'm going uh, hiking in Killarney Park, so I won't, I won't be around for the 21st. Okay, so uh, those of you who aren't aware, we have a whole new line of consumer devices, light therapy devices. It's bioflexwave.com. Check that out uh, for some specials and deals. Um, really great equipment uh, um, and work a little bit differently, although this site is also where you get the personal therapy system as well. You can see all the different devices here. 
And remember, my email is david at bioflexlaser.com. So let's get to some of your questions. A question from Jill, uh, Gil, sorry. Um, Gil, you mentioned, um, by the way, thanks for emailing me um, that information about your chondromalacia patella. I appreciated that. Um, so if one has autoimmune condition, does it disrupt the gut health microbiome or is it other way around where unhealthy gut health causes autoimmune issues or both? Oh, well, an autoimmune is usually genetic, right? So, so, um, when you have an autoimmune issue like rheumatoid arthritis, or, you know, there's a whole bunch of host of other ones, um, it will affect your, um, it affects your immune system specifically for that condition. So I don't know if RA necessarily would have its through its mechanism disrupt the gut health uh, kind of scenario. So I don't know if there's a link there or not. Um, if there is a highly dysbiotic microbiota, can the laser also make pathogenic species grow? So here's the thing, I, I, my takeaway from all this research to this point, Laura, is that um, what it seems to be doing is probably having effect, an indirect effect on the microbiome through reducing inflammation um, and through the immune system. Um, the fact that if you're telling, if we're suggesting that that light's absorbed by that bacteria and affecting their propagation, I think that's a stretch and I don't think that's the mechanism at play here although we don't know. So um, with respect to pathogenic species growing, that has to do with the balance of what is growing in your gut, right? So you, what you want to do is have an overabundance or higher concentration of the healthier bacteria, and then you limit the more pathogenic species from, from growing, right? Because it overtakes them. Um, so that's my takeaway, but we still don't know a lot. I'm sorry, it's not a specific answer, but but uh, we just don't know at this point. And I, but I don't think it's going to cause pathogenic bacteria to grow. In fact, um, you know, we've seen improvement of of um, infect infections using photobiomodulation, in part because of the body's immune reaction to the infection, but maybe in part to its uh, effect on the bacterium as well. Although I'm not 100% sure on that. Does photobiomodulation produce better results on an empty gut? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's been any, uh, there's no research on this and I'm not core. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't really hazard a guess on that. I don't think it would really matter personally. Can Bioflex treat the effects of having taken PPIs, protein pump inhibitors over a very long term? Yeah. I mean, Linda, that's a great question. And, and you saw my, um, mention about protein pump inhibitors having a negative effect. I think the idea here is that if you're going to tackle that, tackle it with everything that you can to improve your microbiome and maybe photobiomodulation will add to the effect of everything else that you're doing. So, you know, these things, when you're trying to take care of something like that, you're looking at a, a long-term project, but doing multiple things to help out the microbiome. And personally, I would be doing it as well. We were taught not to use photobiomodulation over known cancer, um, but doing PBM over abdomen in the presence of cancer in the in the breast, is this okay? Okay, so in, in training, when I do this uh, photobiomodulation training, I talk about it's considered a contraindication to treat directly over an unknown area of carcinoma. So in the case of breast cancer, you wouldn't want to treat directly over the area that where there's cancer in the breast. Um, anywhere else away from that area is okay, as long as there's not any known cancer in that area. We don't know the effects of photobiomodulation in cancer. And to be honest, that it's it's probably beneficial, um, but we don't know. And there's some really good editorials and research on cancer and photobiomodulation. Maybe I'll do a webinar on this. It's kind of controversial, but not because the the contraindication was not based on research. There is some research that suggests that it can increase the propagation or, or the turnover rate of cancer cells in vitro, in test tubes or whatever, but in vivo it doesn't seem to have that same effect. So we don't know, uh, which is why it's still considered contraindication away from the area is okay. Hope that answers the question. Uh, will you talk to the 240 as well? 
So Ali, so if you're using our professional system, um, then you can use that similar kind of protocol, the HIP protocol, just set it up for near infrared and similar to how I've just showed you here. Um, a little bit less time would be needed, probably five minutes to maybe eight minutes because the P or that Duo 240 is, uh, is more powerful than the, um, than the home system. How about customizing a protocol for the therapist system? Um, yeah, Joseph, so you could, so in the, in the therapist system that we have a professional system, there's a customized feature and you can just customize in, uh, the dual near infrared and put in what parameters you'd like. If that, if you're not quite sure on how to do that, just contact me. Um, can you tell me what, which frequency to use? Um, I don't know, like, to be honest, uh, it's preset for the HIP protocol. Um, I don't think necessarily the frequency is going to make a huge amount of difference, to be honest, in a systemic effect. Um, uh, that's just my opinion. It may, but we don't know. As far as infrared laser for this, uh, I mean, you could use the infrared laser as well, but, you know, it's a large area to cover. Um, I don't know how much added benefit it would be, but you could add, you could add that as well, Ali. Hi, Renata. Hi, Renata. Uh, if I'm using the Bioflex wave unit, what protocol would I use for gut treatment if we're standing within four? Okay. Okay. Can you hang? Good question. I'd like you to hold on to that question for my webinar on the wave. So um, I will have a webinar. I'm going to make it a little bit longer and talk about how to use the Bioflex wave. It's not my first choice for this, but if you're going to, you'd be using the near infrared only. Um, and, uh, you, we need to figure out the dosaging, right? Because whether you're four inches or six inches or 12 inches would really affect the amount of light hitting your, um, your bare abdomen. Right. So, uh, Renata, I'll, I'll try and cover that in that webinar. Is there a way to skip the infrared, uh, stage to near infrared? Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this, but when you're using the HIP protocol, you want to let the red light, um, 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 finish before you use the near infrared. So in other words, if I'm placing these arrays on my gut, I'm going to choose the HIP protocol, turn it on, don't apply it to your abdomen until the red light is exhausted, which takes about, I think, 10 minutes or so, eight minutes, whatever, and, and then put the near infrared on. Unfortunately, you can't switch it from one to the other. So you have to let the red run, then use the near infrared. Unfortunately, that's the only way we can do it with the personal system. So that is answer your question, Polly. And I, I don't know why it blanked out. I, I had that thing written down, but I, I didn't, um, I didn't mention that. If you're using a professional system, how would you customize protocol to treat the gut? So I think Paige, I think I covered that. So you would customize. Um, you could customize it for uh, about maybe six, seven minutes, just near infrared. I would just do a continuous wave, 100% power for the for the dual infrared. That's that's kind of what I'd probably do. I don't think at this point pulsing it's going to do a whole lot of um, difference, although I don't know. Clarify the HIP protocol. If you're just using infrared, yeah, so I just did that. Sorry, guys. Uh, so you're going to skip the red, then use the infrared and apply it. I hope that makes sense. And do I think it might be helpful for le leaky gut syndrome? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it potentially could be helpful for, for um, these types of issues. Um, it's certainly worth a try. Everyone's asking me about how to bypass the red light. You can't. It, it automatically goes to red. You got to let the red run, then use the near infrared. Sorry about that. I should have clarified it. Uh, the stem cell webinar, um, I am not sure it should be up there. Um, if not, uh, I will get on my IT fellow to get that up and going. Uh, can it help with no a noisy, a noisy brain syndrome, a noisy brain? Um, Rose, uh, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I'm not sure I really would have an answer for that. We have used photobomb modulation and treated patients with uh, post-concussion syndrome for, you know, brain fog, that kind of thing, um, and, and other um, sort of um, brain issues. And it seems to be helpful in some cases. 
I'm not so sure about this one uh, in particular. For Parkinson's, if you're treating around the, the head or the neck, they suggest 10 hertz or 40 hertz cycles per second. For the gut, just go with continuous wave. For the HIP protocol, hi, Mark, uh, you need to wait for the initial red. Yeah, I know I covered that. <laughs> Uh, I, re I have a refurbished home unit. How would I use this under the dual 180? I think I covered that. So if you have a refurbished home system, um, you would just use the near infrared um, portion of the uh, dual 180. Linda, I, hopefully that, that answers your question. But if not, you can email me or you can call me and I can help you out with that. Is the Bioflex the same as the Bioptron uh, light therapy? No. So I know all about this equipment. Uh, I don't know how, how that works because they use many chromatic wavelengths of extremely low energy. God knows how it works. It uses all sorts of wavelengths that don't aren't traditionally used in photobomb modulation therapy. Um, so I have no idea how that thing works, if it works. It's not traditional photobomb modulation. I wouldn't lump it in the same because it's not. Um, I know all the specs. I know the wavelengths. It's it's definitely, <laughs> I, I just have no idea um, how it could do anything based on the energy emitted and the wavelengths being used. That's based on science. So uh, I do know it. It's from Switzerland. I've seen them around, um, but, and they even have some research, but um, I, I, hazard a guess as to how that could possibly work. Uh, I did mention about IBS, that it might be helpful for irritable bowel syndrome as well, Gene. So yes. Um, hi, Wendy. Any studies using light therapy directly on lymphatic areas, tailbone, sternum, occipital, for example? Uh, mm, no, uh, not studies. Um, haven't seen anything specific for that other than directly in bone marrow when they drill a hole in the bone um kind of scenario but i can check if i find anything wendy i'll uh, i'll send that to you nice nice hearing from you thanks for joining me today um tachana has a question which stage should be used for the dual 240 hip protocol uh okay well to be honest as i mentioned i would probably just um make a customized protocol about 10 minutes or no sorry about um five six minutes maybe even longer at eight minutes i mean it depends on on you know the size of the abdomen um, and dual 240 infrared, right? Uh, and then a continuous wave um, over those areas. Uh, hopefully that uh, makes sense for you. Um, so how long? The, the study showed th uh, three times a week. So, you know, that's a good starting place. Uh, three, four times a week, I think or, uh, would be um, good advice on that. Is it a negative to treat the gut with red before the infrared? I don't think it's a negative. I don't think the red's going to do a lot for your gut. I think that's the whole point there. So um, I don't think necessarily it has any negative effect. I don't know if it has a positive effect. That's kind of why. I, and the research, early research, research is showing infrared has better effect probably because of depth. Um, oh, someone asked about the nano. Yeah, Mark. I mean, yeah, I didn't address that, but you could use the near infrared portion of the nano and try and do this as well. Maybe just a few minutes in each spot. Um, you could try that as well too. But, um, I think my preference is still the personal therapy system. Uh, Ali has a question, a patient with long COVID, a lot of gut imbalances, swelling, uh, long COVID. So what types of long COVID symptoms will I be covering? Um, yeah, so I'm going to cover, um, things like, uh, brain fog, things like, um, uh, sleep dis uh, disturbances, um, uh, poor immune system functioning, um, those kinds of things in that lecture. Hi, Helen. Uh, do we use a daily level three for a week than level four? Or how would I notice any effects? Okay. So I'm going to say, Try, yeah, try level three or level four. I mean, either or should be fine, but this is a long-term project, right? And as far as objectively, how are you going to determine if this is helping or not? That's tough, right? Because 
um, the things that you're looking for um, are everything from bowel movements to uh, which are obviously objective um, to um, how you're feeling, right? So by that, I mean, you know, if, if, if you have a um, poor gut health, typically, you know, you, your immune system is not great. You get lots of infections or colds, that kind of thing. Um, you feel tired, exhausted, um, you know, bloated, all these different things are going on. Um, and you might find improvements of that. If you feel good all, you know, and your biome's already healthy, you might not notice a lot of changes that way. Would not the red light help other aspects? Or do you strongly recommend not using it for gut microbiome? I think I covered that. I don't think it's going to make a big difference. It, it doesn't hurt to use red. I just don't think it's going to have direct or indirect effects that deep. That's all. Uh, yeah, red is good for the skin. True enough. You know what? If you want to use the red and you have a healthier glow to your abdomen skin, then <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, true. Uh, have you come across any research showing increased effectiveness of PBMT use after fasting? No, I've never it's not seen any any research at all with respect to um, uh, intermittent fasting or fasting in general and PBMT. How many joules to apply on a single point on brain for Parkinson's? I'm not going to address that. Sorry, this is not the uh, forum that I can I can possibly um, talk about that. We have guest lecturers that have spoken about neurodegenerative diseases and treating it on our masterclass. Uh, if you care to check that out, it's on our website. But it's this isn't really the forum for me to, and it's not that simple um, to be able to give a recommendation like that. Uh, hi, Rhonda. I think the SEMSA webinar, it was stated that the red light can be target fat cells in the abdomen. Uh, if this is correct, then would it be beneficial to both red? Okay. so. True enough. I mean, if that is true, if your goal is to, to target the the adipocytes or the fat cells, which red light has shown to have some kind of potential uh, for um, uh, um, release of lipids through these micropores, I don't know if that research is really true or not, but potentially, then yeah, the red light definitely would be uh, good for that. So if your goal is try and reduce some of the adipose tissue in your gut, and then get light deeper to your microbiome, then using red and near infrared, it makes sense to me. And then you could use both the red and, and near infrared of that HIP protocol. Maybe I didn't think this out properly, right? I'm, I was more focused on the microbiome. Can one of my clients access this webinar? If so, how? Yeah, it's uploaded to our website um, in a week or two. Uh, and thanks, Wendy, I appreciate the feedback. What protocol is it for those who gained weight recently? So again, uh, I think I did one uh, or talked about before in webinar um, using red light for reducing um, adipose tissue. Not a huge amount of good research on it, but uh, maybe it might help. Would it target the stem cells in the fat cells? Uh, yeah, I suppose. Um, it would um, be absorbed by by um, you know adipocyte stem stem cells. I just don't think they're going to have any effect in the microbiome or in the gut, which is kind of what I was talking about today. Can it be used for gallstone? Uh, no. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. I really appreciated you joining in today. Uh, I do see questions in the chat box, but I, unfortunately, I just can't get to those. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.